Hello, I'm Anne Haddad, museum historian at the Merchant's House. Welcome to our series, Women Who Dared, 19th Century American Women Writers. For background on the theme and the purpose of this series, please stay tuned following the story. Today, I will read two stories by Kate Chopin, The Storm and The Story of an Hour, in which the author presents two women's struggles to achieve freedom from their confining domestic lives and the vastly different outcomes for both. Born in 1850 in St. Louis, Missouri, Chopin is best known for her novel, The Awakening, published in 1899, an important work of early feminist literature, and her many short stories that address women's search for identity and their inner lives. Chopin died in 1904. Our first story, The Storm, although written in 1898, did not appear in print until 1968, owing to its risque nature. In this sexually explicit tale set in Louisiana, Chopin presents a woman who finds fulfillment outside of her marriage and domestic sphere, thereby transcending the prevalent notion of womanhood. The leaves were so still that even Bibi thought it was going to rain. Babinois, who was accustomed to converse on terms of perfect equality with his son, called the child's attention to certain somber clouds that were rolling with sinister intention from the west, accompanied by a sullen threatening roar. They were at Friedheimer's store and decided to remain there till the storm had passed. They sat within the door on two empty kegs. Bibi was four years old and looked very wise. Mama, be afraid, he suggested with blinking eyes. She'll shut the house. Maybe she got Sylvie helping her this evening, Babinois responded reassuringly. No, she ain't got Sylvie. Sylvie was helping her yesterday, piped Phoebe. Babinois arose and going across to the counter, purchased a can of shrimp, of which Calixta was very fond. Then he returned to his perch on the keg and sat stolidly holding the can of shrimps while the storm burst. It shook the wooden store and seemed to be ripping great furrows in the distant field. Bibi laid his little hand on his father's knee and was not afraid. Calixta, at home, felt no uneasiness for their safety. She sat at a side window sewing furiously on a sewing machine. She was greatly occupied and did not notice the approaching storm. But she felt very warm and often stopped to mop her face on which the perspiration gathered in beads she unfastened the white collar at her throat. It began to grow dark and suddenly realizing the situation, she got up hurriedly and went about closing windows and doors. Out on the small front gallery, she had hung Bob and Wa's Sunday clothes to dry and she hastened out to gather them before the rain fell. As she stepped outside, Alcée Labinière rode in at the gate she had not seen him very often since her marriage and never alone. She stood there with Bob and Wa's coat in her hands and the big raindrops began to fall. Alcée rode his horse under the shelter of a side projection where the chickens had huddled and there were plows and a harrow piled up in the corner. May I come in and wait on your gallery till the storm is over, Calixta? he asked. Come long in, Monsieur Alcée. His voice and her own startled her as if from a trance, and she seized Bobinois's vest. 
Alcee, mounting to the porch, grabbed the trousers and snatched Bibi's braided jacket that was about to be carried away by a sudden gust of wind. He expressed an intention to remain outside, but it was soon apparent that he might as well have been out in the open. The water beat in upon the boards in driving sheets, and he went inside, closing the door after him. It was even necessary to put something beneath the door to keep the water out. My, what a rain! It's good two years since it rained like that, exclaimed Calixta as she rolled up a piece of bagging, and Alce helped her to thrust it beneath the crack. She was a little fuller of figure than five years before when she married, but she had lost nothing of her vivacity. Her blue eyes still retained their melting quality and her yellow hair, disheveled by the wind and rain, kinked more stubbornly than ever about her ears and temples. The rain beat upon the low shingled roof with a force and clatter that threatened to break an entrance and deluge them there. They were in the dining room, the sitting room, the general utility room. Adjoining was her bedroom with Bibi's couch alongside her own. The door stood open and the room with its white monumental bed, its closed shutters looked dim and mysterious. Alce flung himself into a rocker and Calixta nervously began to gather up from the floor the lengths of a cotton sheet which she had been sewing. Bobbin was with Bibi out in that storm if he only didn't left Friedheimers. Let us hope, Calixta, that Bobbin was got sense enough to come in out of a cyclone. She went and stood at the window with a greatly disturbed look on her face. She wiped the frame that was clouded with moisture. It was stiflingly hot. Alce got up and joined her at the window, looking over her shoulder. The rain was coming down in sheets, obscuring the view of far off cabins and enveloping the distant wood in a gray mist. The playing of the lightning was incessant. A bolt struck a tall chinaberry tree at the edge of the field. It filled all visible space with a blinding glare and the crash seemed to invade the very boards they stood upon. Calixta put her hands to her eyes and with a cry staggered backward. Alcee's arm encircled her and for an instant he drew her close and spasmodically to him. Fonte, she cried, releasing herself from his encircling arm and retreating from the window. The house'll go next if I only knew where Bibi was. She would not compose herself. She would not be seated. Alce clasped her shoulders and looked into her face. The contact of her warm, palpitating body when he had unthinkingly drawn her into his arms had aroused all the old time infatuation and desire for her flesh. Calixta, he said, don't be frightened. Nothing can happen. The house is too low to be struck with so many tall trees standing about. There, there, aren't you going to be quiet? Say, aren't you? He pushed her hair back from her face that was warm and steaming. Her lips were as red and moist as pomegranate seeds. Her white neck and a glimpse of her full, firm bosom disturbed him powerfully. As she glanced up at him, the fear in her liquid blue eyes had given place to a drowsy gleam that unconsciously betrayed a sensuous desire. He looked down into her eyes and there was nothing for him to do but to gather her lips in a kiss. It reminded him of Assumption. Do you remember in Assumption, Calixta? He asked in a low voice broken by passion. Oh, she remembered. For in Assumption, he had kissed her and kissed her until his senses 
would well nigh fail, and to save her, he would resort to a desperate flight. If she was not an immaculate dove in those days, she was still inviolate, a passionate creature whose very defenselessness had made her defense against which his honor forbade him to prevail. But now, well, now, her lips seemed in a manner free to be tasted, as well as her round white throat and her whiter breasts. They did not heed the crashing torrents, and the roar of the elements made her laugh as she lay in his arms. She was a revelation in that dim, mysterious chamber, as white as the couch she lay upon. Her firm, elastic flesh that was knowing for the first time its birthright was like a creamy lily that the sun invites to contribute its breath and perfume to the undying life of the world. The generous abundance of her passion, without guile or trickery, was like a white flame which penetrated and found a response in depths of his own sensuous nature that had never yet been reached. When he touched her breasts, they gave themselves up in quivering ecstasy, inviting his lips. Her mouth was a fountain of delight. And when he possessed her, they seemed to swoon together at the very borderland of life's mystery. He stayed cushioned upon her, breathless, dazed, enervated, with his heart beating like a hammer upon her. With one hand, she clasped his head, her lips lightly touching his forehead. The other hand stroked with a soothing rhythm his muscular shoulders. The growl of thunder was distant and passing away. The rain beat softly upon the shingles, inviting them to drowsiness and to sleep, but they dared not yield. The rain was over and the sun was turning the glistening green world into a palace of gems. Calixta on the gallery watched Alcée ride away. He turned and smiled at her with a beaming face, and she lifted her pretty chin in the air and laughed aloud. Babinwa and Bibi, trudging home, stopped without at the cistern to make themselves presentable. Bibi, what will your mama say? You ought to be ashamed. You ought to put on those good pants. Look at them, and that mud on your collar. How you got that mud on your collar, Bibi? I never saw such a boy. Poor Bibi was the picture of pathetic resignation. Babinois was the embodiment of serious solicitude as he strove to remove from his own person and his sons the signs of their tramp over heavy roads and through wet fields. He scraped the mud off Bibi's bare legs and feet with a stick and carefully removed all traces from his heavy brogans. Then, prepared for the worst, the meeting with an over-scrupulous wife, they entered cautiously at the back door. Calixta was preparing supper. She had set the table and was dripping coffee at the hearth. She sprang up as they came in. Oh, Bobinois, you back. Oh my, but I was uneasy. Where you been during the rain? And Bibi, he, he ain't wet, he ain't hurt. She had clasped Bibi and was kissing him effusively. Bobinois's ex explanations and apologies, which he had been composing all along the way, died on his lips as Calixta felt him to see if he were dry and seemed to express nothing but satisfaction at their safe return. I brought you some shrimps, Calixta offered Babinois, hauling the can from his ample side pocket and laying it on the table. Shrimps! Oh, Babinois, you too good for anything. And she gave him a smacking kiss on the cheek that resounded. We'll have a feast tonight, mm-hmm. Babinois and Bibi began to relax 
and to enjoy themselves. And when the three seated themselves at table, they laughed much and so loud that anyone might have heard them as far away as La Villiers. Alcée La Villiers wrote to his wife Clarice that night. It was a loving letter full of tender solicitude. He told her not to hurry back, but if she and the babies liked it at Biloxi to stay a month longer. He was getting on nicely and though he missed them, he was willing to bear the separation a while longer, realizing that their health and pleasure were the first things to be considered. As for Clarice, she was charmed upon receiving her husband's letter. She and the babies were doing well. The society was agreeable. Many of her old friends and acquaintances were at the bay. And the first free breath since her marriage seemed to restore the pleasant liberty of her maiden days. Devoted as she was to her husband, their intimate conjugal life was something she was more than willing to forego for a while. So the storm passed and everyone was happy. And now on to our second story, one of Chopin's most popular works, The Story of an Hour, which first appeared in Vogue in 1894. The fact that this story is very short in no way diminishes its power. Knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with the heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. It was her sister Josephine who told her in broken sentences, veiled hints that revealed in half concealing. Her husband's friend, Richard, was there too, near her. It was he who had been in the newspaper office when intelligence of the railroad disaster was received, with Brentley Mallard's name leading the list of killed. He had only taken the time to assure himself of its truth by a second telegram, and he hastened to forestall any less careful less tender friend in bearing the sad message. She did not hear the story as many women have heard the same with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once with sudden wild abandonment in her sister's arms. When the storm of grief had spent itself, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. There stood, facing the open window, a comfortable roomy armchair. Into this she sank, pressed down by a physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach into her very soul. She could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all a quiver with the new spring life. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song which someone was singing reached her faintly and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. There were patches of blue sky showing here and there through the clouds that had met and piled one above the other in the west facing her window. She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair quite motionless, except when a sob came up into her throat and shook her, as a child who has cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. She was young, with a calm, fair face, whose lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength. But now there was a dull stare in her eyes, whose gaze was fixed away off yonder, on one of those patches of blue sky. It was not a glance of reflection, but rather indicated a suspension of intelligent thought. There was something coming to her and she was waiting for it fearfully. 
what was it? She did not know. It was too subtle and elusive to name, but she felt it creeping out of the sky, reaching toward her through the sounds, the scents, the color that filled the air. Now her bosom rose and fell tumultuously. She was beginning to recognize this thing that was approaching to possess her. And she was striving, oh, striving to beat it back with her will, as powerless as her two white slender hands would have been. When she abandoned herself, the little whispered word escaped her slightly parted lips. She said it over and over under her breath. Free. 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 The vacant stare and the look of terror that had followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright. Her pulses beat fast and the coursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. She did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial. She knew that she would weep again when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that had never looked save with love upon her, fixed and gray and dead. But she saw beyond that bitter moment a long procession of years to come that would belong to her, absolutely. And she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. There would be no one to live for her during those coming years. She would live for herself. There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have a right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention or a cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in that brief moment of illumination. And yet, she had loved him. Sometimes. Often, she had not. What did it matter? What could love, the unsolved mystery, count for in the face of this possession of self-assertion, which she suddenly recognized as the strongest impulse of her being? Free body and soul free, she kept whispering, free. Josephine was kneeling before the closed door with her lips to the keyhole, imploring for admission. Louise, open the door, I beg you, open the door. You will make yourself ill. What are you doing, Louise? For heaven's sake, open the door. Go away. I am not making myself ill. No, she was drinking in the very elixir of life through that open window. Her fancy was running riot along those days ahead of her. Spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday she had thought with a shudder how long it might be. She arose at length and opened the door to her sister's importunities. There was a feverish triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. 
Richard stood waiting for them at the bottom. Someone was opening the front door with the latch key. It was Brentley Mallard who entered. A little travel stained, composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella. He had been far from the scene of the accident and did not even know there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry, at Richard's quick motion to screen him from the view of his wife. But Richard's was too late. When the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of a joy that kills. So I will leave you to think about both of these stories. Please note down your comments and questions and join us on April 8th at 6 p.m. for a discussion and Q&A with Elaine Showalter. Please go to www.merchantshouse.org slash calendar to register for this free event. To learn more about this series, please keep watching. Next Sunday, we will conclude our series with a short story by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. I do hope you join me then. Thank you for listening today and until next time. Hello everyone. My name is Annie Haddad and I am the historian at the Merchant's House Museum. It is my great pleasure in honor of Women's History Month to welcome you to our new series Women Who Dared, 19th Century American Women Writers. In this series of short stories, we will explore how women writers of this period give voice to the pressing issues that were facing women by pulling back the curtains that shrouded their lives to reveal the harsh realities of life in the home and in American society. Defying convention by invading the traditional masculine domain of literature, these writers use their narratives to lay bare the pervasive marginalization of women who were restricted by what was called the cult of true womanhood, of which the prized virtues were piety, submissiveness, domesticity, and purity. They also boldly raised questions about racism and prejudice within the society. While being told to suffer in silence and given constant reminders of their imposed inferiority, many women felt trapped and unfulfilled and hungered for recognition of their plight. As a result, these female writers were critical and commercial successes, despite the largely dismissive attitude of writers and critics. For example, in 1855, a resentful Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote to his publisher, America is now wholly given over to a damned mob of scribbling women and I should have no chance of success while the public is occupied with their trash. Many of these innovative feminist themed stories appeared in the popular periodicals of the day, such as Godey's Ladies Book, Peterson's, and the Atlantic Monthly, and in popular gift books and literary annuals, where they were probably read by the Treadwell women who occupied the home on 4th Street that today we know as the Merchant's House Museum. Since the letters in the museum archives provide little information about the inner lives of Eliza Treadwell and her six daughters, we may read these stories and wonder whether or not they shared the experiences and thoughts expressed within them. 
Now, after being largely excluded from the American literary canon for a large part of the 20th century, the rise of women's studies programs and attention to feminist literature led to a renewed appreciation of these authors and their works. The renowned literary and feminist scholar, Elaine Showalter, edited two of the anthologies from which my story selection was taken. I am thrilled to inform you that on April 8th, Dr. Showalter, Professor Emeritus of Princeton University, will be joining us for a virtual discussion and Q&A. Dr. Showalter has written extensively on the short story form as a tool by which women writers could express the circumstances of women's lives. Her expert insights will surely enliven our discussion, so I do hope you join us for that event. Now, you probably have not heard of most of the writers in this series. In that case, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to them. Before we begin our first story, I would like to recite one stanza of a poem by Anne Bradstreet titled Prologue. Considered to be one of the most important early American poets, Bradstreet was the first writer to be published in the North American colonies. A mother of eight, she wrote many poems that addressed her domesticity, her Puritan faith, and her struggles to remain committed to her writing despite the confining role she was assigned to by virtue of her sex. In prologue written in 1650, Bradstreet reflects with a mixture of anger and sarcasm on how society rejects the idea that a woman may have creative impulses. I am obnoxious to each carping tongue who says my hand a needle better fits. A poet's pen all scorn I should thus wrong. For such despite they cast on female wits. If I do prove well, it won't advance. They'll say it's stolen or else it was by chance. 